Hey everyone, it's Pastor Lori. Welcome to the first of two sessions on the Gospel according to Mary Oliver, the wonderful poet. And I will be including over these two sessions other women poets as well. But I'm so glad that you are here today with me and I really appreciate it. Um, I have wanted to do this session for quite some time now because those of you who hear me preach often or have seen some of the liturgy that I've put together or some of the quotes I've made in meetings or gatherings know that I often use the words and images of Mary Oliver. I just didn't think that I would be sharing these sessions with you during a pandemic and without some response or feedback or some question and answer time and an opportunity to hear your thoughts as well. So I have to admit, I'm feeling a little bit like an English prof right now, giving some literature class or uh, doing a TED talk, but I hope that you will bear with me as I maybe will throw out some questions, questions that I was really hoping that you could share some answers with or your response, but I would love if there are any reflections or thoughts through this that you email me or text and maybe we could still have some dialogue. I also am a little hesitant about putting this out into the universe because a lot of the research I've done about Mary Oliver, some of her history and some thoughts about her poetry, I have gone to other sources, primarily the New Yorker magazine. Over the years, they have written a lot about her. And also, interestingly enough, the Unitarian Universalist Church, they kind of claim that Mary Oliver is their poet laureate. And so I'm going to claim her as the UCC's one also, although I know we have a lot of great poets in the United Church of Christ. So some of the things I will be sharing with you uh, have come from other sources, which I am not necessarily saying what they are and so forth. So please give me a break and I hope I'm not called off to, I don't know, where they take people who quote people without giving them full credit, but I'm hoping that all will be well. Um, interestingly enough, today I'm talking about the Gospel according to Mary Oliver. It's also a morning that we're doing the Gospel according to Elton John. And that's happening at 11 o'clock a.m. And this is part of our annual post-Easter celebration, resurrection celebration, where we do a series called The Gospel According To, and then choose some kind of pop group or rock and roll group or individual and, and so forth. But the whole idea is that there is this cross intersection with faith and pop culture. And so that's happening at 11, and ironically today we're talking about the gospel according to this incredible poet. And again, I think it's kind of a cross-section of what does it mean to find faith or images of faith in and I don't in this room want to say pop culture for Mary Oliver, but certainly with the arts. Well, what does it mean, a gospel according to? Um, especially when Elton John claims to be an atheist and Mary Oliver always struggled with faith, although certainly I think she may be one of the most religious, spiritual, um, faithful people that has ever written things. And interestingly enough, as her life progressed and she experienced more of life and the struggles and the pains and the ups and downs, she, she came into faith much more deeply. And we'll talk a little bit about that as this session goes on. But ever since I was a child, I always heard that gospel means good news. And I think that both Elton John and 
Mary Oliver have good news in and through their art. And some theologians, biblical scholars, may argue that gospel refers more to specifically good news of and lessons of Jesus Christ. But again, I think for our sake today, we're gonna to talk about good news as the intersection of art and faith, um, especially in regard to lessons imparted or that are about inspiration. I'm gonna occasionally watch my clock here so that I don't overwhelm you with too much information and save some things for, for next week, but I also wanna make sure that we end in time so that you can tune in to our Gospel According to Elton John service. But let me talk a little bit about, um, about Mary Oliver and who she is and share with you some of her poetry and give you some reasons why I am so inspired by her. Actually, one of my very best friends, Kate, you've heard me talk about Kate over the years, I know, uh, began a couple years back an Advent and Lenten series around the poetry of Mary Oliver. She convened a, a group of women who were kind of over the church, and so they began to meet kind of as a woman or women church, and one of their first prophets or gospel writers was Mary Oliver. And I think for many of us who are in the church, especially as, as women, are, are deeply inspired by the lessons that she teaches and provokes and the inspiration within her poetry. So before I go any further, let me read to you one of her poems so maybe you can get your bearings and catch a glimpse of the poetic sensibility of Oliver that I am kind of speaking to today. This is a poem, one of my favorites, but I will say that about every poem I read today, so be ready for that. It's the poem called Mindful, and she writes this, every day, I see or hear something that more or less kills me with delight, that leaves me like a needle in the haystack of light. It was what I was born for, to look, to listen, to lose myself inside this soft world, to instruct myself over and over in joy and acclamation. Nor am I talking about the exceptional, the fearful, the dreadful, the very extravagant, but of the ordinary, the common, the very drab, the daily presentations. O oh, good scholar, I say to myself, how can you help but grow wise with such teachings as these? The untrimmable light of the world, the oceans shine, the prayers, that are made out of grass. I so love that. Um, you know, Mary Oliver actually brought me back to poetry. I, I give her full credit for that. I had drawn away from it for some time for the sake of prose or novels and literature and so forth. So for many years, I, I really kind of stopped liking poetry. Um, I still always loved certain lines in poetry and used them often to quote from or to call upon for inspiration. Over the years, like Robert Frost, no two roads diverge into a wood, and I took the road less traveled, and that one has made all the difference. I mean, who can go wrong with, with such an inspiring line like, like that? Or Maya Angelou from I Know Why the Cape bird sings when she writes, the caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown, but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. I think I just invoked so much inspiration and, and beauty. Um, from departure, Edna St. Vincent Millay wrote these words, 
I wish I could walk for a day and a night and find me a dawn in a desolate place with never the rut of a road in sight or the roof of a house or the eyes of a face. Well, I wanted to share that particular poem with you because you're going to hear a little bit more about St. Vincent Millay in, in just a, a bit. She was very in, integral to Mary Oliver's life, and, but I'll, I'll tell you about that in, in just a moment. Well, I kind of talked about these one-liners, these poems that we're all familiar with because of, of their one-lines, like, he was my north, my south. You, you probably know Alden's poem like that, or again, Robert Frost, Two Roads, and, and so forth. Well, my passion for, for Mary Oliver began with a one-line from what has become probably one of her most famous poems, and it's called The Summer Day. And I bet you might recognize this, A, because you've heard me quote it at nausea, maybe, and also it's become one of those lines that is kind of floated out there in, in lots of different ways. But let me share with you this poem by her. It's called The Summer Day. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down. Who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Oh man, I love that line. Tell me what you're going to do with your one wild and precious life. I actually have that embroidered on pillows and framed in picture frames and, and so forth all around my office and, and at home because for me it is this reminder that life is fleeting and it is wild and it is precious and that by gum we should be doing something, something with it. Well, out of finding that line, I began to read her other poems and found them to be so meaningful and so accessible, so beautiful. Of, of course, what I like about them, interestingly enough, is exactly what the, the critics have taken her to task for. Uh, poetry, poetry critics called and still call her poetry simplistic, that her verses are too plain. Um, in New York, in the New York Times in, I think it was around like 2011, David Orr, one of the critics, wrote of her work, and I think this is pretty mean, one can only say that no animals appear to have been harmed in the making of it which is not really a nice thing to say. And then he added, if poetry worked as self-help, you'd see more poets driving BMWs. Well, despite her numerous accolades, you know, like the National Book Award and the Pulitzer, the Times never did publish a full review of any Oliver's book during her lifetime. Ruth Franklin, who wrote in a New Yorker profile of her in 2017 on the occasion of 
the release of her, her really wonderful book. If, if you can only get one book, I highly recommend this one called Devotions. It's really a wonderful compilation of so many great poems. And um, Franklin wrote of Oliver at that time, and I agree with her, that Oliver wrote fundamentally accessible poems, blank verse in a conversational style, with no typographical gimmicks. Well, Oliver herself told NPR in 2012 that poetry didn't need to be fancy. And she went on to say, I have a feeling that a lot of poets writing now, they sort of tap dance through it. I always feel that whatever isn't necessary should not be in the poem. Well, I kind of like that, and like me, I've had other friends say that they really did not know how to love or even like poetry until they found Oliver's work. And it's kind of this accessibility in the end that made some, that made some critics bristle or lambast her or worse, even ignore her for being readable and having a throng of fervent yes, mostly female fans, um, several of whom even started devotional blogs dedicated to Oliver's reading her work as a daily mindful practice. For some reason, the critics just did not think that was appropriate or good, that the poetry needed to be a little more difficult in its understanding that you need to kind of be able to unpack poetry and, and find the nuances in it. But it is the forthrightness, the simplicity that I so adore about Oliver's poetry. I have to say to her credit from everything that I have read, Oliver didn't seem to mind that the, the critics came after her. She actually rarely gave interviews and whenever she did, they were kind of gracious and urbane, free of, free of bitterness. But let me give you a little more of a biographical sketch of Oliver and then get to some of her, her poetry. But I think understanding where she came from, as it's true for all of us or for, for any artist, um, helps us understand what their work is, is all about. But Oliver herself liked to present herself as kind of an old-fashioned poet who walked the woods most days accompanied by a dog and a notepad. Uh, apparently, she picked up this habit in Maple Heights, Ohio. I happen to know Maple Heights, Ohio. Um, during her era, it was kind of a semi-rural suburb of, of Cleveland. But I, I know Maple Heights, and there are still lots of woodsy areas around there and uh, while there's been a, lots of development of homes you know kind of suburban living there there's still a beautiful woods and i i was telling someone just the other day that i can still imagine like fall in maple heights where you would walk through the woods and you would hear the rustle of the, the leaves that had fallen or catch the golds and the cinnamons and the reds of the, the leaves that, that were there. So I, I kind of have her pegged walking through these woods in the, in the fall or in the spring, even in the chill of winter and the warmth of, of summer. But she was born in 1935 and Again, according to this article by Ruth Franklin, that she would walk in the woods with the poems of Walt Whitman um, in her knapsack. And this was an escape for her from a really unhappy home. Um, she had a sexually abusive dad, um, a ne neglectful mom, and so it was really, as she described, a very dark and broken home that she came from. And she said once to Krista Tippett, you know Krista Tippett from NPR, to this day, I don't care for the enclosure of buildings. So for her, the outdoors, the nature was her true sanctuary, was her place of, of peace. 
Apparently she began writing poetry at the age of 13 and she said that I made a world out of words and it was my salvation. And while she didn't often talk about her difficult childhood, um, she did own up several times to having recurring nightmares and claimed, rightly so, that there was damage. I mean, how could there not be? Um, she went on to once say, we are now just starting to have a broader cultural conversation around women's trauma, about how so many women move through the world with such heavy burdens. And certainly she was describing herself in that quote. But for more than five decades, Oliver truly gave voice to the process of confronting one's dark places. And she did that once again through nature by peering underneath, say, toadstools or looking into stagnant ponds. And as many of her poems suggest that when she would look there in those places, she would find forgiveness or grace. Um, what she found was that in nature, she was able to once again love the world. One of my favorite poems, I told you I would say this about all these poems, one of my favorite poems is When Death Comes, which I really hope will be read at my funeral, not anytime soon, but I love this so much. And she talks about how wonder, W-O-N-D-E-R, wonder, amazement, astonishment, um, has to be earned. And she talks about almost as a marriage, that like a marriage that takes nurturing and constant vigilance, so does all. Um, so does amazement, so does wonder. And by comparing herself as a bride, she yoked herself then to amazement. That amazement is like the bridegroom. And so she gave herself this lifelong assignment, however difficult, of looking up and observing and seeing. Here's this poem. When death comes like the hungry bear in autumn, when death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut, when death comes like the mesopox, when death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades, I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering, what is it going to be like, that cottage of darkness? And therefore, I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And I look upon time as no more than an idea. And I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each life as a flower, as as common as a field daisy, and as singular, and each name a comfortable music in my mouth, tending as all music does towards silence and each body a lion of courage and something precious to the earth. When it's over, I want to say all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited the world. Isn't this such another great line of her poetry? I would love to have that embroidered on pillows and in picture frames all over my house too. Listen to that line again. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. Well, back to her growing up. It was in her childhood that Oliver discovered both her belief in God and her skepticism about organized religion. It was in this interview with Krista Tippa that she said it was in Sunday school that she discovered she had troubles with the resurrection, 
but was probably still more interested than many of the kids who did ultimately enter into the church. Nature, however, for her, with its endless cycle of death and rebirth, really fascinated her and eventually spoke to her of resurrection. And we'll talk a little bit more about how this faith that she developed later in her life uh, became kind of integral to who she was, her beliefs, and her, her poetry. But it was in observing nature, the cycles of nature, that you know, all of us see, those of us who come up north certainly know those cycles, that, that rhythm of nature that goes with spring and the, the beginnings of the blooms and then summer when things are at their fullness and fall, when things begin to disappear and change and die and winter when everything is kind of frozen but underneath the ground rebirth is starting to take place and the cycle starts again. It's really resurrection language. It's really images of resurrection. And so later on, she will speak of resurrection in poetic ways using nature. It was in 1953, after she graduated from high school in Ohio, um, that she left home. And on a whim, she decided to drive to Austerlitz which is in upstate New York, to visit Steepletop, which is the estate, and here's that name I told you about earlier, the late poet Edna St. Vincent Millay. She and Millay's sister Norma became good friends, and it, um, Oliver more or less ended up living there for the next six or seven years, helping organize Millay's papers. She did take classes at Ohio State University and in Vassar, though she never earned a degree, and eventually she moved to, to New York City. It was on a return trip to Austerlitz in the late 1950s that Oliver met the photographer Molly Malone Cook, who was 10 years her senior. She writes of seeing Cook for the very first time I took one look and fell, hook and tumble. And M, she always called Molly M. M took one look at me and put on her dark glasses along with an obvious dose of reserve. Well, Cook lived near Oliver in the East Village where they began to see each other little by little. And in 1964, Oliver joined Cook in Provincetown, Massachusetts, where Cook for several years operated a photography studio and, and ran a bookshop there. One of the descriptions about Cook came from filmmaker John Waters. And remember, and it still is somewhat, but in the, the 50s, 60s, 70s, even into the 80s, Provincetown, Massachusetts was kind of this bastion for the LGBTQ community. You know you could be there and, and be safe. You could be who you were meant to be. It kind of was this, this gay community. And I, I used to visit there a lot. In fact, my, we would vacation there often during the summers. And it was just kind of a, a place of of freedom and goodwill. So you can kind of see why Cook and Oliver settled in there. But John Waters, who was the, the director, said he remembered Cook as a wonderfully gruff woman who allowed her help to be rude to obnoxious tourist customers. I love that description. It kind of explains who, who Cook was. but. The, the two of them, Oliver and Cook, stayed together until Cook's death in 2005 when she was 80. And actually, all of Oliver's books up to that date were dedicated to her beloved Cook. Um, after her death, Oliver wrote of Molly, her beloved, these words. Though you have known someone for more than 40 years, 
Though you have worked with them and lived with them, you do not know everything. I do not know everything, but a few things which I will tell. M had will and she had wit, and probably too much empathy for others. She was quick in speech and she did not suffer fools. When you knew her, she was unconditionally kind. But also, as our friend the Bishop Tom Shaw said at her memorial service, you had to be brave to get to know her. Well, at the end, Oliver lived in Florida after M's death, and for the years right before her, before her death, and she always said, I'm trying really hard to love the mangroves. Um, she seemed to have been regarded as a cross between a celebrity recluse and a village oracle and the community in which she set up her, her life in those final years. She always said that she had wished not to be noticed and to be left alone and she sort of succeeded. But she tells this great story of being greeted regularly at the hardware store by the local plumber who would ask her how her her work was going and she his. And she said that there was no sense of eliteness or difference. But on the morning that the Pulitzer that she received was announced, she was scouring the town dump for shingles to use on her house. And a friend who had heard the news noticed her there and joked, so you're looking for your old manuscripts? So you can see that even as a Pulitzer Prize winning poet, she still longed for the, the simple life. It was in 2012 that Oliver was diagnosed with lung cancer. She was treated and given a clean bill of health, but she ultimately died of lymphoma on January 17th of 2019 at her home in Florida at the age of 83. So really, she's very much a contemporary poet. Well, as I have already said and alluded to, her poems draw such inspiration from nature. Besides walking through the woods in Ohio, her practice was always to go on long early morning walks through the wetlands and forest around her home in Provincetown at the very tip of Cape Cod. It was there walking in the woods that she developed a method that has become the hallmark of her poetry, and that is of taking notice simply of whatever happened to present itself. Like Rumi, another one of her favorite models or poets, Oliver sought to combine the spiritual life with the concrete, an encounter with maybe a deer or the kisses of a lover or even a deformed and stillborn kitten. But for her, she would simply walk and pay attention, stopping occasionally to jot down a note. And she once wrote to pay attention, this is our endless and proper work. And her instructions for living a life were these, pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. Let me say that again. Pay attention, be astonished, and tell about it. And this is truly what she modeled on her walks. She paid attention. She was constantly astonished because she was paying attention and in and through her poems, she would tell us about it. Remember that great line she said, when it's over, I want to say all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. Well, one of the poems that reflects this philosophy of pay attention, be astonished, tell about it, is her poem, Notebook. And yes, I will say, just to be consistent, it's one of my favorites, but here's, here's that, that poem. It's, it goes like this. 6 a.m., the small pond turtle lifts its head into the air like a green toe. 
It looks around. What it sees is the world swirling back from darkness, a red sun rising above the water over the pines, and the wind lifting and the water striders heading out, and the white lilies opening their happy bodies. The turtle doesn't have a word for any of it. The silky water, the enormous blue morning, or the curious affair of his own body. On the shore, I'm so busy scribbling and crossing out, I almost miss seeing him paddle away through the wet black forest. More and more the moments come to me. How much can the right word do? Now a few of the lilies are a faint flamingo inside their white hearts, and there is still time to let the last roses of the sunrise float down into my uplifted eyes. Well, if I can speak of the Gospel of Mary Oliver, then I think I can most certainly make a leap to the theology of Oliver. Kathleen McTeague writes regarding Oliver's theology, by that word, theology, I mean not only what her poems reflect of her beliefs about God, but what they reflect about a host of other religious questions, such as what is holy, who are we, what are we called to do with our lives, what is death, and how do we understand it when we turn our faces toward its inevitability. These kinds of questions matter to all of us, and the answers in Mary Oliver's poems feel so true. And I think that's, again, why I'm so drawn to Mary Oliver's poetry, that there is kind of this underlying theological basis for it. And, and theology is answering questions such as, what is holy? Who are we? What are we called to do with our lives? And if we approach Oliver's poetry in, in such a way, I think she gives us something to think about and to hang on to and to kind of connect with, with our own lives. I'm going to close in, in just a moment. Let me check the time um, and save some stuff for, for next week. But I want to continue on just for a moment about her theology and the kinds of poetry that allude to our, our faith and specifically the Christian faith. A couple of her poems really, you can see, are very connected to scripture or to the words of Jesus. So she apparently knew her Bible, whether that came out of that Sunday school time as a child or that she was still reading her Bible throughout the years or she did some biblical research or reading or whatever over her life. But the one verse is Matthew 6, 28 and with 29, which reads, and you'll recognize these words from Matthew. Um, and why do you worry about your clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that Solomon, even in all of his splendor, was dressed like one of these. You may remember that. I, I love what, that passage. It, it comes out of the right thing of Matthew that is attributed to Jesus saying, oh, don't be anxious about your life. Consider the birds of the field and all of the plants and things that are growing. If, if God dresses and clothes all of them and cares about them, how much more will God care about you? Well, it's out of those verses that Mary Oliver wrote this poem, another everyday poem, and she writes, Every day I consider the lilies, how they are dressed, and the raven, how they are fed, and how each one is a miracle of Lord, love, and of sorrow. For the lilies in their bright dresses cannot last, but wrinkle fast and fall, and the little ravens in their windy nest rise up in such pleasure at the sight of fresh meat that makes their lives sweet. And what a puzzle it is 
There's such brevity. The lavish clothes, the ruddy food makes the world so, food, so full, so good. You can just kind of connect that, can't you, from Jesus' words to, to Oliver's words. Also in her poem, Lilies, she writes this that likewise connects to those words of Jesus. I have been thinking about living like the lilies that blow in the fields. They rise and fall in the edge of the wind and have no shelter from the tongues of the cattle and have no closets or cupboards and have no legs. Still, I would like to be as wonderful as the old idea. But if I were a lily, I think I would wait all day for the green face of the hummingbird to touch me. What I mean is, could I forget myself even in those feathery fields? When Van Gogh preached to the poor, of course he wanted to save someone, most of all himself. He wasn't a lily, and wandering through the bright fields only gave him more ideas. It would take his life to solve. I think I will always be lonely in this world where the cattle graze like a black and white river, where the vanishing lilies melt without protest on their tongues, where the hummingbird, wherever there is a fuss, just rises and floats away. I think both of these poems speak of the lushness of life to supply every need. The joy of life, even in such brevity, is a wonder to behold. For the lilies in their bright dresses cannot last, but wrinkle fast and fall. I think she truly offers a pr perspective on life that few acknowledge deeply. It doesn't matter how long a life is lived to enable offering joy and love to others. It is making the world full and good with the time you have. And in doing so, she flips the sorrow of loss into recognition of gratitude for life and the experiences that life offers. And yet there seems to be an awareness that something still separates her from this kind of life. Remember in that poem I just read, Lilies, I think I will always be lonely in this world where ravishing lilies melt without protest on their tongues. Where the hummingbird, wherever there is a fuss, just rises and floats away. As one writer has said, it is the existential quest for wholeness and purpose in life. We are not always as self-assured as this. We are more like the people that Jesus admonishes in the Christian scriptures, worrying about having our needs fulfilled or protected protected from harm from this day to the next. Even at the end of life, the lilies without protest melt their existence into fodder for the cattle. I think Mary Oliver captures this sentiment for us, letting us know that the flora and fauna in its worthless awareness has a peace and wholeness about life that we humans have somehow lost but that we still have the opportunity to seek and to find, to be aware, to see, to be astonished, and to tell about it. Well, I think that's it for today. Um, next week, we're gonna talk a little bit more about, if you look up here, you'll see a picture of Mary Oliver with her beloved dog, Percy. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Percy, because any of us who are dog lovers love her, her poem. She, in fact, wrote a book which drove the poet, the poetic critics or the poetry critics mad, um, called Dog Songs. I think it's just, it's just amazing. And we'll talk a little bit more about her liturgy, the poetry that is about liturgy and so forth. And I'm gonna also talk a little bit more about several other women poets who have certainly influenced me and 
um, help us to recognize the extraordinary in the ordinary, just as Mary Oliver always did as, as she walked the woods and walked nature. Um, I'm going to end and you're going to get to see just a little clip of Mary Oliver reading her very famous, popular, and one of my favorite poems, Wild Geese. I really hope you enjoy hearing her read it and to listen to the words. And I look forward to seeing you next week as we continue this series. Thanks so much for, for being here. Continue to be astonished. Take care, bye-bye. Wild Geese. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. <laughs>